<clears throat> amen and amen. Hallelujah, good people. How is everybody today? Thank the Lord. Um, by God's grace, uh, we are live on air again. Let me just check in, make sure things are going through okay, and we will get started here. <clears throat> um, like I said, I'm hoping everybody is good. Um, it sounds like things are going through, so I'm going to put this aside, and good to see you. Let's pray and get right on. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are Lord, you are God. You are Father, you are friend. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and care for us so, so deeply. Thank you for the grace to be saved, the grace to walk with you, the grace to share your word on air with everyone. Thank you, Lord, for the lives that you are touching even through this little exercise. Indeed, it has impact and all glory and honor comes to you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege to serve in this manner. May you be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, sweet people, good to see you. And it's my birthday today, so taken me a little bit to get on air, but I thought I'll go in and see what I can share on my wonderful birthday today. God is good, God is gracious. I do not take it for granted that I'm alive that I'm well, that I'm, I'm celebrating a birthday today, and it, it, it's, just, it's just awesome. God is good. God is good. So um, um, today I hesitated about starting a new character, but I think I will because there's a lot to cover, and the end of the year is getting close. I, I'm hoping it's my... my uh, I'm really hoping we can conclude this Walking by Faith series this year, but we'll see what the Lord enables us to do. So um, I'm for, because of that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on a new character today. Hey, thanks, Sylvia. Thanks for the birthday wishes. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started on a new character today, and hopefully we'll conclude this series by the end of the year. But if we don't, we have time until Jesus comes or until he calls us out of here. Amen. <clears throat> uh, the character today is David, and he's a lot. He's a handful. So I'm, I'm looking through and thinking it's going to take us five, maybe six installments to get through this man to some substantial degree. Uh, of course, I can never exhaustively teach everything. I don't know everything. So I will never put myself in that position. But uh, whatever that the Lord has laid on my heart is still a lot for this one man. But we'll see what we get through. Um, so, David, David, David. Everybody knows King David of Israel, uh, or I think majority of people know. I can't assume that anymore since not everybody goes to Sunday school. Um, but we encounter this man many, many times in, in many portions of Scripture. But here in our interest of growing uh, in our faith um, and walking by faith in the Lord, I'm going to draw our attention back to Hebrews chapter 11, 32 through 34. And it says, And what more shall I say? <clears throat> For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David. So we catch a glimpse of this man. The writer of Hebrews has run out of time to tell us something a little more about these people. And so in this case, David, and then he mentions Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. That is Hebrews 11, 32 through 34. And let me just say right here, <clears throat> we see David mentioned. And 
from all those phrases and, and accomplishments that this group of characters do, I can quickly call out how David subdues kingdoms, right? We see him take on some Philistine territory. Um, we see him stopping the mouths of lions. Remember, in one portion of the scripture, he rips a, a, a lion apart and, another po- and then again a bear to rescue the sheep. He was a shepherd, right? And then we see him elsewhere in scripture. He's escaping the edge of the sword, starting with his, his uh, uh, predecessor Saul trying to kill him to many other, the battles that this man fought, his 70 years of life on earth were many. And we see him escaping the sword through all those battles. And out of weakness were made strong. This is a man who was not thought of highly, not by even his own family. That's why when Samuel comes to anoint king from the house of Jesse, nobody is thinking of David. He is a lowly man. He's a shepherd boy on the backside of the pasture land. No one really cares about him. He's a lowly man, right? But God raises him up from there. And he's taken out of weakness and made strong. Once again, here is a man who is a shepherd, not quite trained and ready to be a, 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 an, an army man or a warrior, but God makes him strong and helps him fight all the battles of his life. And he comes up top as king over all of Israel, right? Praise the Lord. And he became valiant in battle. I mean, his own warriors would give testimony of this man. At one point, I remember when they are telling Absalom, you know your father, he is a mighty warrior. These are men of war telling of another man of war. And they know, they say, we know this man. He's quite a warrior. He's a valiant man. He's not a flimsy man, right? He turned flights of armies, uh, uh, armies of aliens to flight. Hallelujah. So, so I like this character, David. He's not without his own flaws. We'll get into that later. He's a man like any other man. He's a human being, you know, fallen, deprived of the glory of God. But he rises from that. And we're going to learn some lessons of faith from this character in the coming days. And so I'm excited to get started on this man on my birthday. Uh, and, and let me just go a little deeper before I jump off because I'm really trying to keep this short. I, I wish I had time to get through all those, but I'm just mentioning as an intro to David. So who is David? First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 26 through 30 summarizes this character very well for us. And you could agree or disagree, that's fine. I just like the way that the author of Chronicles puts it here. He says, David, and I usually quote out of the New King James Version, but I liked this portion in the NIV, and so I've got it out there in the NIV. And it says, David, son of Jesse, was king over Israel, right? He ruled over Israel for 40 years, seven in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. He died a good or a, at a good old age, having enjoyed a long life, wealth, and honor. His son Solomon succeeded him as king. As for the events of the king of, of King David's reign from beginning to end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the records of Nathan the prophet, and the records of Gad the seer, together with the details of his reign and power and the circumstances that surrounded him and Israel and the kingdoms of all the lands. That is a quick summary of who David is. He's the son of Jesse, so we are told who who his lineage or family, rather, family is. We are told that he was king over Israel for 40 years. A part of that, short part of that in Hebron, and then the longer part of that in Jerusalem. He died at 70. And back here, the Bible is telling us this was a good old age. The Bible actually says that that man, all of us today, our full life is really 70 years old. Anything above and beyond that is bonus from the Lord. And trust me, I am going for the bonuses that I can get from the Lord. So don't get me wrong here. But 70 for this man was a long life. Remember, 
he is coming from very humble circumstances, from shepherding. I don't know that shepherds lived long. Maybe they did from drinking the milk from their livestock. I don't know. But it was a humble life. And then on top of that, he has war after war after war. If he is able to escape the sword, those many fighting years, I would take 70. I will take 70 any day. Hallelujah. Considering what he goes through and how many battles he has to fight, 70 is a long life. God bless him. God blessed this man with a long life. Not only that, he had wealth. He had plenty. I mean, his sons ate at his table and there was food to spare every night. Glory to God. He had clothing. You know, we, we're told the king's daughters were clothed in beautiful dresses. You know, they, they, he had wealth. He didn't lack. He wasn't poor per se in his latter years. And then he goes, it goes on to say honor. The man died an honorable life. He was honored in Israel. No wonder many other kings who come after him, when they die, it says they were buried in the same burial ground as David or in the tombs around where David was. He was an honored man. He was an honorable man. Now, like I said, he had his own faults. Nonetheless, he is a man who knew what to do when he has sinned and he made those things right. So he died an honorable man. And then he leaves an heir to his throne. Glory to God. You know, one thing about this walk of faith is that when we do our work well, there will be an honorable person to carry that work forward. When our work just dies and goes to the ground, we have to stop and ask ourselves, why? So for his own son, in fact, this is crazy. But this was a son between him and Bathsheba. Who would have thought that God would so, so very much be fond of David as to forgive his sins? And not only that, to give him an heir to his throne from the same situation where he sinned the most. In killing Uriah and taking Bathsheba, they, of course their first child died, but then the second child lives to be king to succeed his father on his throne. Wow, what a merciful God. What a gracious God. What a full redemptive story to have to speak of today. So David died an honorable man, and he has an heir to his throne. Glory to God. And then we have, we are told other um, uh, records where we can read some more about his accomplishments and how it was like for him in his day. Of course, these records are now all, I shouldn't say all, but most part of these records are lost. There are a few records, say, in the Vatican, a few records in the most recent findings, you know, Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. This is, this is all kind of parts and pieces of history, parts and pieces of the story of Israel that we will never fully put together until the return of Jesus and I know by the way Jesus is coming back I know some of us think he's not maybe we meander off and forget but Jesus is coming back and so until then we will not have the full picture but there are parts and pieces of this that you can go glean out if you so wish but now the the, the other question I want to ask or answer you know we've tackled briefly who is David now why David why David the, the quick and short answer is that this man's heart was after God. He's a man who so, so loved and reverenced God that God took note of and actually used or, or, or used that as a reason to bless him, right? So that's the short answer. But let's look a little deeper. David, I'll, I'll just read for us, First Samuel. 13, verse 13 and 14, and, and we get a recount of that in the book of Acts 13, 22 and 23. But in 1 Samuel 13, 13 through 14, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. This is when Saul decided to, to play the priest and offer sacrifices instead of waiting for Samuel as they were facing off with the Philistines. 
And then Samuel comes to the ground, and 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 of course, as uh, Saul had had not done what he was instructed to do. But then Samuel says, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Acts. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Mark that. That's important. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. So why David? Because all the while, while Israel is murmuring and complaining, while Israel is rejecting the judges over them and wanting to have a king, God is looking for a single man whose heart is intently focused to do his will. And, and Saul sins against God. So God decides, you know what? I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you because you have not kept my commandment. Brethren, the key thing about walking by faith is keeping the commandment of God, keeping the law of God, keeping the precepts of God. If we cannot bring ourselves to the place where we obey God, if we cannot surrender our own will and pursue the will of God and do the will of God. Our hearts can never be described as being after God. God is looking for obedience. The Bible says that we are the children of obedience. We are children whom when God says do, we do. When he says don't, we don't. That is walking by faith. And this is the kind of heart that David had. When God said, don't do this, he stopped. When God said, do this, he went on right ahead and quickly did it. Walking by faith. We can learn from David very quickly. That the Bible says, God looked for a man. Other parts will, uh, portions, I mean, translations of scripture will say, sought for a man. God is always looking for someone. God is always looking for someone to obey his commands and do his will. I am so excited and thrilled to know that God simply doesn't go off of what anyone tells him. He doesn't simply go off of what I think about my sister, what I think of you. I can go to God and I say, I don't like this about sister so-and-so, or I like this about so-and-so. That's all good. We can go before God with our concerns. We can tell him what we feel, what we think. That's fine. But God in his integrity does not simply operate or react or carry forth anything based on what you bring before him about another child of his he does not even go off of what the devil accuses his children about. Right? Remember the story of Job when the, when the angels of God are gathered before him and says the sons of God and Satan was among them. And he is looking. You see, God is in the business of looking. And he has looked at Job's ways and he found this man to be a man of integrity. And he has a testimony about him and he tells Satan about it. And Satan says, no, it's because you've put your protection around him. If you take it, you know the story. But God does not simply act based on what someone else tells him. God has his own eye looking what Rose is doing. God has his own eye looking what Priscilla is doing. God has his own eye seeing what Deborah is doing. God has his own eye seeing what Paul is doing, what John is doing, what Matthew is doing. Name them. 
And the Bible says, the Bible says that he looks even to the intents and motives of the heart. So every time I'm doing something, it is beyond the action I'm doing that God is looking. He's looking at Rose. What motivated you to do that? Was it true faith or was it just wanting to show off? Lord, when the Lord looks at what I do or don't do, he goes deeper than what I do or don't do. He looks at Rose. What is your intention in doing this? Are you intending for people to be saved, to glorify me, or are you intending for people to glorify you? God is God. Oh, I, I love the Lord. And here the Bible tells us that he was looking, in the days of David, he was looking for someone to do his will. And when Saul failed, he quickly picked up this young lad tending to the sheep and brought him over. And, and he says, the Lord, saw, in Acts, he says, a man after his own heart and commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept the Lord, uh, uh, what the Lord commanded you. This is speaking to, to Saul. But over in, in Acts, he says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do my will. And then we are given another reason why David why? Why, David? Because God is looking for a godly and obedient seed. He raises this man so that out of him he can raise a savior for Israel. Let me tell you something. When the Lord raises you up, it is not to end with you. He is raising you up so he can use you to raise another person up. Glory to King Jesus. You are being lifted up is great and we celebrate it and it's awesome. But it's also for you to be used of God as you do his will to raise others up, to raise others up who will be for the salvation of many. Glory to God. Let me finish, let me move real quick. I don't wanna run out of time. But we're covering why David, and, and, and the quick answer was because he was, his heart was after God. But furthermore, he walked in obedience to do the will of God. And beyond that, he was used of God to bring deliverance to the entirety of Israel and now the entirety of the human race. Glory to God. The Savior, Jesus, is Lord and Savior of Israel, the nation, and all the Gentile nations of which many of us belong. Amen, amen, amen. So David is a shepherd. Yeah? Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. And then he is raised to be a warrior. And he is raised to be a king. Right? 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 3. And 2 Samuel, uh, actually 2 Samuel 1, sorry, chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. He's, he operates in the priestly calling. He knows to worship God. He knows to seek God. He knows to intercede and stand between judgment and mercy and plead with God to reign mercy instead of judgment. That is the priestly function, to worship God and to intercede. We see David doing that, and I can't get into all the details of that, but we see him as, as a prophet. He is prophetic. He tells of things to come, including prophesying about the Messiah to come. David is so prophetic. You read the Psalms and you think, oh, wow, this is what... And you could parallel that with many, many instances in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, for example. Hallelujah. And David is king. He's got this kingly anointing upon him as well. He is anointed to rule over Israel as a nation, but also as a foretelling of the king of kings, Jesus Christ, who will rule over the entire world. Glory to God. So David is critical in the history of humanity and in the establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. Glory to God. And we see him anointed at least three times. He was anointed three times. Once in the presence of his brothers when Saul, I mean, sorry, Samuel 
went over with a horn of oil to anoint him as king over Israel. He was anointed to become king over Israel, but that didn't happen until 30, when he was 30 years old. And that was his third anointing, so to speak. The second time he's anointed by the tribe of Judah. And he's, he's, he manages to rule over Judah alone for a period of time before he's able to now rule over the entire 12 tribes of Israel, right? And, and so 1 Samuel 16, 13, he's anointed by Samuel. Second uh, Samuel 2, verse 1 through 4, he's anointed as king over Judah. And then Second Samuel 5, 1 through 3, he's anointed at Hebron, or, or uh, yeah, at Hebron to become king, finally, king over all of Israel. And I love this about when they come to anoint him this third time, they do, even though they've been fighting him and resisting him and ignoring him and, uh, and avoiding him to become their king, they finally bow. All of Israel finally bows by recognizing that David is their brother. Brothers and sisters, can we stop fighting? Can we recognize that you are my brother, I am your sister? Can we stop fighting as people of God and bring ourselves under the will of God? It was God's will that David become ruler over Israel, but they fought him for many reasons, from jealousy from Saul to many other reasons. Maybe he wasn't as tall and as handsome as, 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 as uh, Saul was, but he was their brother, right? They recognized his accomplishments over Saul. Remember when the women were dancing? Saul has killed his, what, thousands or hundreds, and David has killed his ten thousands. They recognize that. They recognize that this man, even though Saul tried to kill him many, many times, he was able to escape. They were able to recognize. And they actually speak of that in the, that passage in Acts that we, we read. Is, it, is that where we read? Anyway, somewhere it says that, that it was you, it's in Samuel, it was you who went before us to battle. Not Saul. They, they recognize that he's not a a cheap man. He's not a lazy man. He's a worrying man. He's ready to go to battle. He's too ready to be on the front lines of battle. Where are the men and women in our day who, like David, want to be on the front lines of battle? Today in America, we are in a cultural battle, right? We are at crossroads in our society and around the world. Where are the men and women of faith who are willing to go to the front lines of that battle and say, devil, you're not having our children. Devil, you are not having our schools. Devil, you are not having our churches. Where are the men? Forget Saul. We want the Davids of our day who are willing to go to battle, to the front lines. And over at Hebron, they recognize his his accomplishments over Saul, they recognize that he is God's choice for Israel for that moment. Can we submit when God appoints one of us, anoints one of us, establishes one of us to be ruler or to be leader in some capacity? Can we recognize that as God's choice for that moment? Walking by faith is about submission to leadership. Walking by faith is about recognizing what God is doing and submitting to it and supporting it. Bless the name of Jesus. Rather than get into this church fights and wars and heaven help us. Anyway, as I conclude, I've actually gone longer than I wanted to, but thank God we're still under 30 minutes. So let's say a prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we begin this uh, new character, David today, I am praying, Lord, that we can so much learn from his walk of faith and emulate the same and reach the victories that similar to what he reached and beyond. Thank you, Lord, that He's a man of integrity, a man whose heart is after God. I pray the same for us. May we be after you, Lord. May we truly, truly, truly be after you. Your intent, your will, your purposes in the earth, in our generation. May we truly seek that out and support that out, O oh God. 
as we begin a new week, go before us in every encounter, in every conversation, in every contract, in every business. Help us, Lord, to walk with you. Help us, Lord, to be examples of faith wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, dear ones, God bless you next time.